This is perhaps an opportune moment for us to freeze our heroes in mid-plummet and swing back in time to the first major fall of the day. You will remember how, mere hours before, Miles had succeeded in tipping one teammate to her supposed death and then pushing his brother off the top of a cliff, sealing the deal with a wrist bump. This was step one in his audacious plan to hoodwink the Duke and save the regrettables. For, in fact, ye of little faith, it was never Miles' intention to betray his twin. Certainly indulging in criminality is a foul family trait. But, unlike the backstabbing bleed em dries, one foul would never sell another down the river. Or over a cliff edge, for that matter. In Miles' mind, his plan was simple mathematics, and therefore utterly straightforward. And it never would have made it onto the CHOMP chart of Miles' plans that he updated on a weekly basis and kept on Nani's desktop. The current number one was his plot to steal an Egyptian pyramid during an eclipse using only a revolutionary system of pneumatic levers and some double-sided tape. As a matter of fact, Miles had been mildly surprised when Lord Teddy even partially fell for his ruse. But he supposed that, in all fairness to the Duke, he had been missing a vital piece of information. That being the fact that Lazuli had allowed Miles to examine her wrist computer as the Orient Express passed through Switzerland. During this cursory examination of the display, he had quickly realized that the system Regen Me P, Regeneration Mini Program, was funneling power to functions in order of urgency. The first priority for reactivation was the computer's readout itself. The LP device had not yet been ready for complex calculations, but Miles had determined, using the exponential growth equation y equals abx, that the circuits would regenerate sufficiently to provide the next available function, flight mode, in 17 hours. And so, Miles had started a mental countdown toward that time. Fast forward 17 hours minus 5 seconds, and we find the so-called regrettables clustered at the edge of St. George's Precipite. Miles was finishing up his countdown to the moment he could safely nudge Specialist Heights over the edge. Her rings activated just as predicted, because science, and it was only when Miles saw Specialist Heights hovering at a safe altitude that he tackled Beckett. Not literally tackled him, of course, for that would be foolhardy given Beckett's experience in all matters physical. Instead, he blabbled on about brotherhood and loyalty, and that was just structure noise. The important information exchanged between the brothers was passed through the medium of foul argot. Miles did not go into details, for he knew that Beckett preferred the direct approach. And, in this spirit, he waggled his tie with three fingers, and Beckett realized that everything was okay. So, when Miles told him to jump, he did so without hesitation. To explain, the Fowl family had, for years, enjoyed Film Night, but the only movies that could tempt Artemis into the den and away from his laboratory were the old black and white Laurel and Hardy shorts, which never failed to crack everyone up. Even Butler had been known to stop scowling, which was his equivalent to an uncontrollable laughing fit. The most famous running joke in those movies was when Hardy waggles his tie and says to Laurel, Well, here's another nice mess you've gotten me into. Which was something Miles often had occasion say to Beckett. He generally augmented the quote with the clause, and I suppose it's my responsibility to get us out of it. This sentiment was absorbed into the argot minus the actual words. Miles simply waggled his tie and Beckett was assured his twin had a plan to deliver them from whatever mess they were in. That was all Beckett needed to know, and in fact, wanted to know. So when Miles waggled his tie on the spine, Beckett handed over whistleblower, did a quick wrist bump, and, with utter confidence, leaped over off the cliff into the arms of Specialist Lazuli Heights, who had absolutely zero clue as to what was going on and was only sure of one thing. Humans were unpredictable. Now Lazuli was fallen again, tangled in a jumble of limbs, and it seemed as though the rescue had gone sideways, and this time there was no infernally clever foul plan to cushion their impact. It's up to you, Lazuli, she thought. You're the LAP specialist. Time to prove you're more than semi-precious. Quite a challenge for someone with barely a nanosecond to spare, loaded down with two humans and a toy troll. If only I had thought of magic, she thought for perhaps the 80th time that day. If I had some magic, we might survive this. In truth, Lazuli did not form this precise thought, for it occurred so often that she had assigned it a color. Whenever Lazuli vaguely lamented her lack of magic, an angry orange screen rippled across her inner monologue. It was true that many hybrids never manifested on the magical spectrum, but some were late bloomers. 
Even so, Lazuli was coming to the end of her 60th year, and no longer an adolescent by anyone's measure. In the academy, she had been the only member of her class without some kind of magic. And she was the only specialist in the history of the LEP without magic. It was stressful enough being a tiny blue pixel, but Lazuli was fine with that. More than fine, actually. She was proud of her heritage, and was, in fact, a member of an online pixel community. But not having magic did rankle. Everything was just so much more difficult. Lazuli realized with some alarm that the orange veil was more intense than usual. In fact, it was dominating her consciousness. Her brain seemed to be heating up and growing too big for her cranium. Perhaps I'm having a panic attack, she thought, which would be of no use whatsoever. Quit it, she told her brain. Think of something useful. But in spite of Lazuli's admonition, her mind focused on her unfair lack of magic and the orange glow intensified, seeming to color her actual vision. Lazuli seemed to have no choice but to give in to the mood, though it was against her nature to wallow. It isn't fair, she thought. We're all gonna die because I have no magic. No stupid magic. As they scythed through St. George's Ring of Mist, it seemed to Lazuli that the cloud itself was tinted orange. Sunset? She thought, is it sunset? But it was not the sun. Lazuli felt the orangeness emanating from her in an irresistible wave. I'm having a psychotic episode, she thought. The hard-packed earth surrounding Childerblaine House rushed up to meet them, and Lazuli knew it would be almost as unforgiving as rock. Someone might survive, she thought. Whoever lands on top... But she abandoned this thought as it seemed that there was no more room inside her for anything but orange, and it became so large that it had to come out. Lazuli felt herself going mad and opened her mouth to scream. But instead of a scream, what blasted from her was a roaring bolt of fire that shot straight down, liquefying ten cubic tons of clay and boring through to the seawater below, which fizzed up to fill the space. Specialist Heights thought that perhaps her mind was supplying a nice hallucination so she would die calmly. But when the group crashed into the cooling slop of a mud bath, she understood that the fire and its effects were real, and she suddenly knew what the mystery 5% of her DNA was. I'm a little bit goblin, thought Lazuli as the mud closed over them. And also, I think I broke my nose. Beckett Fowl was also thinking on the way down. He was totally relaxed now that Miles was by his side, and under his armpit and between his legs and had no doubt that his twin's big brain would take it from here. And so, he simply wondered what they would have for dinner, and whether Whistleblower could do handstands. And then... MUD! Best rescue ever! Miles' pre-impact thought process wasn't so much a process as a loop. His ingenious and largely improvised plan had completely failed, and now they were plummeting toward intense agony at the very least, and there was precisely nothing he could do about it. Miles had, of course, fallen flat on his face before, plan-wise, three times to be precise. But now he was about to fall flat on his face in more ways than one. The shock of his own helplessness had almost shut down Miles' brain, and it was all he could do to mentally mumble, No, this isn't right, I had a plan, over and over until it rebounded in the echo chamber of his mind. Miles did manage to utter two words in the final moment before impact just before a fireball from Lazuli's mouth provided him with a mud bath to land in. Oh my, he said. He really should have kept his mouth shut. High above, Lord Teddy watched the descent from the laboratory balcony. His initial emotional blend at the prospect of the death and maiming that would result from the fall could be described as fierce glee tempered with regret. Glee that the foul twins would be no more, Slight regret that the troll would probably die alongside or underneath them. But mostly glee. Then the cloud of mist turned orange and was suddenly burned off, and so the Duke could clearly see Miles and his sorry bunch tumbling toward a mud pool that he could have sworn had not been there earlier in the day. Blooming hell! swore Bleedem Dry, slapping the railing with one hand. What has the foul brat done this time? It was almost too much for a fella to bear. In all his years on this earth, the Duke had never encountered such an ingenious trickster. And while part of him respected Miles Fowl's wiles, most of him dearly wished to stamp those wiles underfoot. Lord Teddy pointed a rigid finger at the orange mist. 
That was your last chance, my boy! He shouted. Your absolute last chance! If you are indeed still alive down there, then prepare to die. For I, Teddy Bleedem Dry, Duke of Silly, have had enough. Under normal circumstances, the inflamed Duke would be a terrible sight to behold. But on this occasion, Teddy's frizzled hair reminded brittle cotton candy. His soaked swimming costume was more comical than imposing. And his vocal cords, dehydrated from his misadventure with the eels, had elevated his baritone to a far higher pitch. Enough, do you hear me? He squeaked. Prepare to meet John Baker, Fowl! Five minutes earlier, Baker Fowl would have laughed heartily at the sight and sound of the distraught Duke. But then again, five minutes earlier, Becca Fowl was not drowning in mud. The instant mud pool had indeed been a lifesaver, but it was a double-edged one in that Lazuli's firebolt had drilled through the island, finding the ocean below. And while the pressurized water was surging upward now, it could just as quickly drop back down to sea level, taking the regrettables with it. And, as much as Becca Fowl adored sloshing around in mud, he knew in this instinctual way of his that they were, while they were riding a swell at the moment, soon the swell would begin to suck. Okay, team, he said, once his mouth broke the surface. Fun's over. Lazuli heard this, or at least she thought she did. Did Beckett say this was fun? She thought. There must be mud in my ear. Beckett's arm was still looped under Lazuli's belt, and so it took barely any effort to sling the small fairy onto relatively dry land. Whistleblower took care of himself, scampering along his human friend's body and stepping neatly from the crown of the boy's head to solid ground. Becca was about to haul himself and the semi-catatonic miles over the muddy rim when he cocked his head to one side and listened to a wave crash against the nearby shore. Water spout coming, he said, and rode the suddenly rising water from a blowhole, landing easily on two feet with Miles gasping under his arm. The water throbbed skyward in a giant column, then blossomed into a fountain worthy of a Roman piazza. Beckett watched the ocean retreat down the blowhole and grunted in Whistleblower's direction. Whistleblower rejoined with a similar grunt, which Lazuli assumed was an approximation of, Wasn't that awesome? And suddenly she understood Beckett a little better. You just had to think of him as a toy troll, but taller and hairless. Miles Fowl collapsed onto his back, arms crossed on his chest, looking for all the world like a boy laid out for his own Irish wake. He was draped in a shroud of congealing mud, and all that was missing to complete the wake illusion was a pair of pennies for his unseeing eyes. Beckett nudged him with the toe of his fencing boot. Miles, what's the matter? We made it! Miles blinked and salt water trickled from his eyes, cleaning pathways in the mud. My plan didn't work, he said. I failed. Beckett squatted beside him. I used to do what you're doing, he said. Live in the past, but now I know the past is past. When your plan failed, that was then. This is now and we need a new plan. Say goodbye to old failure, Miles, and say hello to new plan, Miles. Miles closed his eyes to absorb this, and then said, But we must learn from our limits from our mistakes, brother. You would always say that learning is good. Is that a lie? Miles opened his eyes just enough to squint at Beckett. Are you using social influence on me, Beck? Me? asked Beckett innocently. I'm the action twin, remember? I don't know anything about brain stuff. Miles clarified the term. Social influence is a tactic by that psychologists use to challenge patients. Beckett pulled Miles to his feet. Whatever you say, Brainiac. All I know is that the really smart but boring guy once told me that what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Is that true, brother? Or was that boring guy just speaking words? The mud fell in sheets from Miles' clothing, and he thought, two suits to destroy it in as many days. But he said, It's true, Beck. Thanks for reminding me. If he were being honest, Miles did not feel very strong at the moment. But, thanks to his brother's optimism, he could feel his confidence already reasserting itself like a fire in his belly. Fire in my belly, he thought. That reminds me. Miles turned to Lazuli, who had torn off her helmet and was vomiting smoke and mud, her back arching with each wretch. Specialist Heights, said Miles. As soon as you feel able, we must be away from here. I imagine the Duke is already on the move. Agreed, Lazuli managed between heaves. Just, uh, yeah. 
second, Miles. You know, continued Miles, that's what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Lazuli was in no mood for German philosophy and shook a warning fist at the twin, but Miles continued to speak undaunted. When you have an interview in your bouts of illness, perhaps we should drill down into what happened. You'd appear to have blossomed into a magical creature. Artemis's files are typically incomplete on this subject, so perhaps you could fill in the gaps. It would help me to strategize if I knew the extent of your gifts. Lazuli knew she wouldn't be much help in this area. The fire breathing seemed magical, but in fact it wasn't. Goblins were born with the biological tools. Heaven knew she had been through enough MRIs and physicals for little things like oil duct at the back of her throat and fireproof body parts to be detected. Today, they had finally served a purpose. She spat into the earth and accepted Miles' offer of a handkerchief to wipe her mouth. I don't fully understand how it's possible for me to make fire. Magic, said Beckett, as if it was obvious. Magic is impossible. Wetzelblower aped Beckett's stance and growled an approximation of the word impossible. Miles nodded. It seems that we'll have to satisfy us for now. Can you walk, specialist? Lazuli flashed on a hot key human movie that she'd always loved, and with a wry grin, said, How bloody well walk out of here! But she wouldn't walk off the island. Ever. Enraged though Lord Teddy most assuredly was, he made time to snatch his bathrobe from its hook and tug on a pair of riding boots that stood sentry by the front door. He checked the pockets for the shells he kept in most of his clothes and selected a 12-gauge Maishi semi-automatic gas gun from the umbrella stand, slinging it over his shoulder, which left his hands free for the two wireless remote mitts that he used to control his various robots and battle drones. He was on a maintenance contract with Maishi, which had cost him a bloody fortune over the years, even with his friends and family discount but it did ensure that St. George's defenses were always ready to go at the touch of a button. The Duke pressed that button now, and the aluminium central server built into his desk clunk once more, then rumbled into life. And now, my boy, thought Teddy, flexing his fingers and the controller mitts, activating literally hundreds of electronic death-slash-gardening-slash-cleaning machines, including dozens of his own construction. Little steampunk fellows with tommy guns attached to their arms, which Ichi Maishi had described as Delightful anachronisms. It is time to end this tiresome chapter in the life of Teddy Bleedum Dry. The chapter titled, Lord Teddy Meets the Fowl Twins. There was only one way, it seemed, to be sure of eradicating the foul blight. Massive overkill. And Teddy was prepared to pound a good chunk of his own island with ordinance to ensure that Miles Fowl and his merry gang were no more. Mostly Miles, if he were honest.